Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to The Upside. I'm Jonathan Oleski with Jaymore, and our show is about to begin today. It's my pleasure to introduce our two outstanding hosts, Beth Goldsmith, Chair of the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore, and Dr. Scott Rifkin, publisher of Jaymore. Beth and Scott, take it away. Thanks, Jonathan, and welcome again to our virtual show, brought to you by the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore and Jaymore Magazine to keep our Baltimore Jewish community informed during this time of uncertainty. Today, we'll be speaking with Congressman John Sarbanes, who has been working hard in Washington to make sure that Marylanders and Maryland businesses find relief during the pandemic. In addition to his support of critical funding that will help our community get through these challenging times, Congressman, Congressman Sarbanes has taken on a number of other important concerns for our state, including joining a bipartisan effort in support of the 2020 <coughs> Census. We're thrilled to have the Congressman here today to talk about these issues. So over to you, Scott, to do the formal introduction. Hey, John, thanks for being here today. Appreciate it. Uh, John's representative, I get any of this wrong, please feel free to correct me, but John's represented us in the third district since what, 2007, is that right? That's correct. So it, it, I got to tell a quick story, and I always do when we introduce a guest. Many years ago, I was working the polls, and I think, I, I don't remember who I was working the polls for, but I think it was Peter Bielinson who was running in Baltimore City. And John's there, you know, handing out some uh, campaign materials. And this guy comes up to John and just does, he just rants at him for like 40 minutes. I'm watching this. I mean, it, it is like drizzling out and it's miserable. And this guy is just ranting at John for like 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And eventually the guy walks away. And, and, and clearly the guy wasn't going to vote for John. I mean, he was on the other side of whatever, whatever the, the issue was. And just ranting. And I went over to John. I said, John, you, you have amazing patience. I would have punched the guy like 30 minutes ago. So I was really impressed. That, that impressed me that you had such patience with a guy who clearly wasn't ever going to be one of your supporters. So I don't know if you remember that mode. You probably don't. I mean, that happens. To well, I, I, can, I can tell you that's that's probably happened to me enough times that I can't remember any particular episode. But you want to be patient. You want to listen carefully to all of your constituents, whether they agree with you or not. And actually, um, I find that um, if you do listen carefully, regardless of people's perspective or opinion, you generally walk away having learned something and you kind of factor that into the job you try to do to represent people as well as you possibly can. Well, you were, you were incredibly patient. You were listening to his points. He was clearly just, just you know, aggressive as can be. And you were calmly answering and talking to him. I was so impressed. I mean, it really, really was pretty well, amazing. Thanks. So, Eddie, I thank you for being here and thank you for representing the district so well for so many years. I mean, obviously, and, and give you a little background on this show. You know, we have a, a few people that watch us live, but mostly it's YouTube and, 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 and uh, Facebook and all this stuff that didn't exist when I was uh, younger. And we get a couple of thousand people who watch the show each week, which is really pretty impressive. And, and so we're thrilled you're here and you're taking the time with us. Um, and and let, let me just kick it off with, with a quick question the pandemic and what's going on in Washington and what's going on with trying to get a bill done. And maybe you can comment for a few minutes on all that sort of stuff. Well, first of all, let me thank um, you and, and your organizations and Jay Moore and Associated and so forth, Beth and Jonathan and Scott for pulling this together, doing it on a regular basis, uh, reaching out, not just the Jewish community, which is obviously the primary audience here, um, and, and I have many, many members of the Jewish community which reside in the third district, but to the broader community. Um, the most important thing in this moment when all these pressures are coming at people um, and there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of uncertainty and confusion is to establish yourself as a trusted source of guidance, assurance, information uh, for people and to communicate. Uh, this is absolutely critical. I'm trying to do it. Uh, through my office, uh, through, through other communication tools that we have, you're doing it in a very compelling way. Um, this is what people need. Uh, they need regular contact and information and communication. So I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you uh, giving the opportunity to, to come on and, and join you with, with a few minutes today. And I certainly appreciate the audience that is, that is tuning in for this. 
Uh, look, we're, we're fighting the pandemic and we're fighting an economic um, crisis at the same time, which obviously has been caused by the pandemic. And I would say that with regard to dealing with the, the virus directly, uh, what we're trying to do in Washington, and we, we did this through the CARES Act, which was the first major relief package that we put out there some months ago. And we're trying to do it again through the HEROES Act, which is being negotiated right now. We did pass it in the House. Um, we're trying to increase our capacity as a country to do the vital testing, to do the contact tracing, uh, to figure out what it means um, for people to be isolated when they do have the infection um, and to push as hard as we can, but as safely as we can to get a virus, uh, to get a vaccine rather to address the virus because that ultimately um, is what's gonna provide the most stability to us as we move forward. Uh, but the critical thing for people to understand Scott, is, is how much they can do, how much is within their own power to combat the virus. It's the little things that we keep talking about, but we keep talking about them because they make a difference. Wearing a mask when you're in public, uh, washing your hands uh, frequently uh, to rid yourself um, of the virus, uh, keeping that social distance. You don't have to go out and be in um, a setting where there's a lot of people. Don't do it stay away from, from those situations uh, and just be smart. Um, the evidence is, and the public health professionals keep emphasizing this for us, that if we take these basic precautions, we can uh, dramatically reduce the spread of the virus, which by the way, helps contribute to our efforts to get the economy back on track as well. So we have put into these relief packages significant funding to help uh, boost our testing capacity. Uh, we have demanded that the Trump administration put a strategic plan in place uh, with respect to producing protective equipment, um, supporting testing across the country. We'd like to see the administration use what they call the Defense Production Act, uh, which would mandate the manufacture of certain of these materials, again, to increase our capacity across the country. So in terms of addressing the pandemic directly on the public health front, these are some of the measures that we've tried to uh, put in place and put significant funding behind them. Obviously, there's another critical tranche of those resources that we're trying to get through the HEROES Act we're negotiating fiercely on that. Hopefully we can get something done in the coming days and get that relief out to people. So on the pandemic itself, those are some of the measures that we're trying to put in place. John, thank you. That was very helpful. And I apologize. What's a meeting without my dog barking in the background? So I do apologize. I don't know how much you guys can hear it, but they're, they're starting to yip a little in the background. So I, I may go on mute at one point when Beth asks a question and see if I can get my dogs to settle down. Uh, that, that's great help. Uh, I, as a physician, I'm always amazed that somehow mask wearing became a political issue. The, the public health people are clear and the scientists are clear. It is not a, 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 a political issue. It's, it's just a health issue. And where people aren't wearing masks and where people are gathering in groups that are too big and where people are denying the science is where the disease has begun to get out of control. And how do, we, how do we make sure the public knows this is public health, not politics? Well, I, what I always try to do is bring it back to the public health experts and to, con, and, and to assure the public that when I'm encouraging them to do something, I'm not basing this on any kind of political ideology. I'm doing it because this is what the public health professionals are telling me are telling members of Congress, are telling political leaders across the country. So, you know, right here in Maryland, of course, we have a tremendous public health resources. Johns Hopkins is, is the one that's collecting, for example, all of the data in a sense to tell us worldwide what's happening with the spread of the infection, the number of deaths that have occurred, et cetera. But University of Maryland Medical System is another resource and we have um, other 
assets on the public health front, including our local public health departments, the Maryland Department of Health, that are good sources of guidance for this. So my assurance to everybody that I communicate with, including the people on the call today, is that when I'm encouraging you to, encouraging you to wear a mask, when I'm encouraging you to maintain social distance um, in every uh, opportunity that you have, um, when I'm encouraging you to, to wash your hands and so forth, I'm doing that because um, that's what the public health professionals are telling me and it's what I'm doing myself. So I'm just trying to be a good example. I don't, I don't wear the hat of providing public health advice as a Democrat. Um, I do it, at, I am a Democrat, but I'm doing it as someone who's trying to contribute to a positive response to this virus and is listening carefully to people like Leanne, Le, Lena Wen, people like um, Josh Sharfstein, uh, people like the heads of these uh, institutions that we have here um, in our state who are expert when it comes to public health. And I would encourage everybody to, to follow the lead of those professionals um, and then follow the lead of the, of the elected officials and those in the political space who also appear to be fo following the lead of those public health professionals. That's how we all stay on the same page and it's how we're gonna overcome this virus ultimately. Let's continue talking about I was going to say, let's continue talking about we all. As one of your constituents, I know that you love to reach out to us uh, virtually or otherwise on a very regular basis. What else are you hearing back from your constituents? What do they expect from you and want from you right now? So they're obviously concerned about the public health dimension of this. That continues to be, I think, uh, right on the front and center. But let's, let's face it. Uh, Beth, we've got the economic impact and it is severely affecting millions of people across the country and hundreds of thousands of people in the state of Maryland. That's why it's so important for us to maintain the uh, level of unemployment insurance benefits that we were able to put together uh, working with the states across the country, but adding that extra level, that extra $600 a week in terms of the pandemic response it, and we've included that in the HEROES uh, Act uh, in terms of what the House passed. Direct payments uh, that we got to Americans across the country, $1,200 uh, per individual with some additional benefits for dependents and so forth. We want to get uh, an additional set of direct payments out to people uh, because we know that, uh, look, when, when the first round of this virus hit us, uh, it was against the backdrop of a very strong economy, which had people uh, positioned a little bit better to handle what was coming at them in terms of the economic impact of the virus. But now that we're into this round two of the virus and the economic impact that's happening, that's against the backdrop of people already being economically stressed. So the importance of keeping those benefits flowing is something that I'm certainly hearing uh, from my constituents uh, every single day. Um, and then we've got other things. For example, state and local governments, including the state of Maryland and including many local jurisdictions here in our state, um, are right on the edge in terms of their budgets because of lost revenue and other impacts from the virus. Uh, one of the things we're trying to get in terms of the HEROES bill is uh, billions of dollars to support state and local governments across the country. A lot of the public health professionals I just referred to a moment ago are employed by state and local governments. If they have to start making cuts, you're cutting back on the very professionals that are helping guide our communities through this very difficult time. Not to mention firefighters, police officers, social workers, others on the front lines that our state and local governments are providing. So we need to provide that. So I'm hearing from people, don't cut off this assistance, extend it for us. And also look at things like um, relief when it comes to mortgage assistance, rental assistance, 
um, and other things like that. So that's one whole basket of concerns that we hear. Another more recently is what's going on with the US Postal Service. Um, the new Postmaster General is experimenting with all kinds of changes, which is creating an upheaval in the Postal Service. And you're seeing folks are not getting their mail on a regular basis right now. That's adding to people's stress. The one institution in America that's sort of quasi-governmental institution that continues to get very high ratings from the American public is the Postal Service. We rely on that in so many ways right now, particularly in the middle of this pandemic, to start uh, messing around with this, the structure of it in ways that will delay people getting the mail, make them more anxious about their opportunities to vote by mail across the country. That's craziness in this moment. So I'm hearing a lot about that as well. And we're, we're trying to get as much information, I will say, from the Postal Service about what's going on with this, push back, make sure they're doing things sensibly. Again, why? Because we want to provide that assurance to our constituents. So those are some of the things among many that, that I'm hearing about from my constituents. And can you just continue on that mail-in voting topic? Sure. Um, without without yeah. taking necessarily a partisan position. Well, well you know something, it's, it's not a partisan issue. If you look uh, traditionally, um, vote by mail has been embraced in blue states, but also red states and purple states across the country. Um, it's something that both parties have traditionally encouraged their voters to take advantage of because it's easy, it's convenient, et cetera. So to be honest, until the president decided he was gonna make it into some kind of a partisan issue, that's not how it was being perceived out there in the public. Um, we're trying to get some support for the Postal Service generally to shore it up, but also to make sure they have the capacity to process increased vote by mail. We're trying to get support to um, uh, I guess, resource the elections generally in terms of preparedness around safety measures and other kinds of things. And I can tell you, we have letters addressed to us in Congress, and I've been sort of a point person on this whole issue of elections and voting um, in, in Congress. We get letters from secretaries of state who are Republicans and Democrats saying we need help, send the resources. Why? because these election officials, Beth, they wanna do a good job. This is what they do. They wanna have a good election. They wanna, they wanna uh, do an election, put on an election that we can all be proud of, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. So they're not making a partisan issue of it. They're just saying, this is a matter of basic patriotism. Let's do it right. We believe that our democracy is the greatest in the world. Let's show people that we can run an election, vote by mail is important to that. I would have preferred that um, Governor Hogan had stuck with what he did here in Maryland in the primary, which was just to send a ballot to every registered and eligible voter. Um, instead, he changed up course a little bit uh, or fairly dramatically, and now is, is gonna require an application um, before that can happen. That's gonna be confusing, I think, to some voters, but that's water over the dam. At this point, we all need to make sure Maryland voters are as educated and informed as they can possibly be on what the process is. So for vote by mail, you're gonna get an application in the mail. You then fill that out if you wanna get a ballot in the mail and you send it back to the Board of Elections and they will send out your ballot. So you can apply for that now, or you can wait till they send you the application. My, my recommendation is anything you can do now, um, do now, do not wait till later. And then well, we just got word that there will be about 360 what they call voting centers across the state. That's about 25% of what we normally have available um, on election day. So, now the task is make sure those are staffed properly. There's enough poll workers. There's enough safety measures in place so that people have confidence that they can vote. 
But again, I would say to the average voter out there, if you can vote by mail, vote by mail. If you can vote early, vote early at one of the early voting centers. And then if, if, if all you can do is get there on election day and vote in person, we're gonna do our best to make sure that those voting places are safe. But let's take every opportunity that's being made available to us to cast our vote in our democracy. It's the most important form of protest and registering who you are and lifting up your voice that Americans have. And we ought to so, take advantage of that. So the other day I went online and I found the, the, the proper website, which wasn't very hard to find, and registered for, I guess it's absentee ballot. I, mean, yeah. I think it's all the same thing. And it took no more than seven minutes. I needed to know my social security number last four digits and I needed to have my driver's license number. And other than that, there was nothing else to it. It was simple. It was easy. And I assume I'll get in the mail in the next week or two or whenever they send them out. I guess it'll be a while, but I'll get a ballot in the mail at some point. And that was a pretty simple process. So I agree with you. Let's encourage people to do that because at the end of the day, wouldn't it be nice to have everybody vote? And then we know what, the, what, what, what people want. If well, you know what? Or thirty percent of people vote. Who knows? We just we just we just lost John Lewis, the great uh, civil rights foot soldier, voting rights foot soldier. It was a colleague of mine for the fourteen years I was in Congress. It was a privilege to serve with John Lewis. It's crazy that more than fifty years after he was beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, protesting for voting rights, that it's still so complicated in America to register and vote. We should be leading the, the world in terms of how we do this. And a lot of the reforms that I was proud to assemble in HR1, which was the first bill that the Democrats introduced last year in the 116th Congress called the For the People Act, which would reform ethics and accountability, address the, the undue influence of money in our politics, but also put a lot of voting reforms in place. A lot of those measures are just designed to clear a path to the ballot box for the American people. So you don't have to run an obstacle course every two years to get your vote counted. That's crazy. We can do better than that in this country. Um, as Elijah Cummings always used to say on the oversight committee where I served with him, we're better than that. We can figure out a way for people to be able to cast their vote and have it counted in this country. So everyone should take advantage of this opportunity. Make sure your voice is heard. And by the way, you mentioned up front the census, Beth. Um, the census is the other way. This year, the two most funda fundamental ways that Americans have to raise their hand and say, I am here and I am to be counted are in play. The 10-year census and voting in a presidential election. So let's take advantage of both those opportunities. And I encourage people, if they've not filled out the census survey yet, uh, to do that. Um, you can do it over the phone. You can do it by going online. You can do it through the mail. But we want to make sure we get that percentage of respondents as high as it can possibly be. So, John, on a related topic, and I agree, I mean, voting and census are two great ways to exercise freedom in a, in a democracy. Uh, on a related topic, and certainly a big topic for the, for the summer, you know, the Jewish community has taken a lot of pride over the years in being at the forefront of racial equality issues and civil rights and all that sort of, all, all those, those topics. Where do we go from here with this summer and what's been going on this summer in, in the Black Lives Matter movement and in, in the, the, the protests that's going on around the country? What are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, obviously, this is a wrenching time uh, for our country. We've gone through these moments before, but I think, um, as many are observing, this time is different. First of all, uh, what happened to George Floyd, which was captured on video, broadcast around the world, uh, it, it left no room for sort of competing interpretations. Everyone who saw that video and was receptive to kind of assimilating and digesting what they saw, uh, came away horrified by that incident. And I think newly ready to address the fact 
that institutional racism and violence is embedded deeply still in our society across the country. And there are many, many organizations um, that reflect that, um, including law enforcement organizations. So we have to get deadly serious, uh, sadly to use that phrase, about addressing this sort of um, embedded racism in our society and being more honest to start about the conversation. But then also appreciating that conversation's not enough, words are not enough. We have to move quickly and deliberately and in a sustained way, because often what happens is these incidents occur, there's a conversation, the space is created for a moment and then it dissipates and we move on. So in a sustained way, we have to figure out how to take our angers and concerns and the anguish over this and translate it into real reforms. At the state level, Maryland is certainly going through this process right now. The General Assembly is looking at things that they can do in the reform space and at the federal level. And I was proud to have supported uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which took some very meaningful measures addressing the issue of qualified immunity, which ends up getting abused sometimes and sort of uh, protecting against the kinds of inquiries into police brutality that ought to go forward, but banning um, choke holds and carotid holds um, and these no-knock warrant assaults that happen and so forth. These are all things that when you step back, uh, make common sense in terms of a more rational approach to public safety, but we have to follow through on this. And I'm certainly committed to that. I know from listening in to the conversations that are happening um, in the Jewish community that there's leadership there as well to try to address uh, the situation we find ourselves in. Um, I'm most concerned, to just put an emphasis on this though, that uh, we'll move on. Uh, Cause this is, it's human nature, first of all. Um, in crisis, you get people's attention, but then something else comes along to divert their attention. And that can be very well-founded. I mean, there's so many things coming at us right now that it's hard to kind of maintain our commitment to any priority. But on this one, if we expect to move our country to a different place um, and begin to build those bridges, heal wounds, um, and elevate ourselves as a society and as different communities, we've got to sustain our commitment to addressing police brutality and racial violence in our culture and in our society. We have an opportunity to do that now, um, but it's not gonna be easy. It's gonna be uncomfortable. Uh, and to sustain our commitment to that, I think, um, is critical. As a policymaker, um, I'm determined to do that, but we can only do it if we have the participation and partnership of every community that cares about it. So thank you for bringing it up. It demonstrates, I think, uh, the Jewish community's sense of priority on this as well. So John, you've got, and, and Beth, if you've got a question, jump in, I apologize. I keep asking all the questions. You know, it's okay, Scott. Um, I, I was just going to really ask because I wanted to make sure. Whoops. I think we just lost Beth. I did. Yeah. Can you guys Hi, hear Scott. me? Fair enough. I'll jump in then. No problem. John, uh, if I recall correctly, you have won. I'm sorry, Beth. We lost you for a minute there. What were you asking? I know. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. Sorry. I, I was losing my video. Um, I, I, I figured it out. Um, <laughs> I would just ask, make sure that we give you an opportunity to talk about any other priorities. Um, I, I know the census bill is really important to you. We've now covered voting, we've covered social justice. I mean, I know we haven't covered anything. And I'm sure that going forward and looking forward, we are called the upside. Let's talk about some of the other priorities that you have for our future. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that. I mean. Some other priorities I would just mention in terms of the HEROES Act negotiations and our efforts there. Obviously, uh, we want our schools to be safe. Many parents are contending with that 
uh, situation right now. We're in that back to school mode, but in a lot of places, it's still not completely clear what that's going to look like online, in person, hybrid, et cetera. That creates a lot of uncertainty for people. Again, getting funding to our school systems across the country is critical to that. And we put millions of dollars into the HEROES Act um, that would provide that kind of support. Food insecurity across the country, Beth, is climbing at alarming rates. Uh, people are going hungry. And um, providing that kind of support and assistance to people, particularly to children. Um, if you look at the HEROES Act, just through the eyes of the impact that the coronavirus is having on children across the country, you can design most of the relief that we've proposed in there based on that perspective alone. So look, yes, it's a lot of money we wanna commit here, but the Federal Reserve Chairman has said, if you're ever gonna borrow money, now's the time. Interest rates are virtually uh, zero at this point. So we can do it. We have the capacity as an economy to borrow the money, to put it towards these needs right now. In addition, a lot of these unemployment insurance benefits and other assistance will go back into the economy and keep the, the economy from collapsing. So it all makes perfect sense to do what we proposed in the HEROES Act. So those kinds of interventions are critical. We're gonna to continue to push them in this moment, but there are other priorities. Obviously I've been a champion on the environment, uh, fighting climate change, which we're experiencing the effects of every single day, uh, preserving and protecting the Chesapeake Bay, which Marylanders love and benefit from and really take the lead on. I mean. You know, the Chesapeake Bay watershed involves six states in the District of Columbia, but we are right there on the water's edge in terms of the bay. And Marylanders have a special sense of stewardship uh, when it comes to the Chesapeake Bay. And so fighting uh, to do the right thing on the environment um, is critical as well. And I've tried to lead there on education, making sure that the burden, the debt burden on students who have to borrow for higher education um, is something that they can bear. And in some cases, can we relieve them of that? Not just in this moment, um, but over the long term. So a lot of focus on education. And then healthcare, I mean, this is my background. For 18 years, Scott knows this. I mean, I, I worked in the healthcare arena representing healthcare providers. Um, and I bring a special interest uh, to that issue. I serve on the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Health uh, Subcommittee. Um, I hope what's happening is we're learning a lot of lessons right now about where the holes um, and the weaknesses are in sort of baseline public health infrastructure across this country. The reason I think we're lagging some of our peer countries in terms of our response is that in many places we're going from a baseline of really zero infrastructure to try to meet people's needs instead of starting out at a higher level. We have to learn our lessons from this and make sure that we put good, strong public health infrastructure in place, make sure people have access to healthcare, the coverage um, that goes with it, et cetera. So that's a lesson to be learned going forward. So I'm gonna to continue to bring attention to that. And then my number one mission, we've referred to it, is let's, let's fight corruption and fix democracy. People are so cynical and angry uh, when they look at a government, particularly they look at Washington and they feel like it works for insiders uh, and special interests and they feel left out of their own democracy. Uh, I've made it kind of my crusade over the last 14 years to get these reforms in place that will restore people's faith in the way government operates. That's a hard sell. These days, people have gotten very cynical, and I understand that. But look, this is the only democracy we have here in our country. We've got to make it strong again. So that means voting reforms, uh, fixing partisan gerrymandering across the country. And you know what my district looks like. So I'm certainly interested in a, a, a sort of rational way of approaching uh, that. 
ethics and integrity. What's that about? People saying to us, when you go to Washington, just behave yourself. Remember who you sent, be accountable, be transparent, and then creating new ways of funding campaigns in America that lift up the voices of small donors uh, so we don't have to go hat in hand to the PACs and the lobbyists and the special interests. This is all about just restoring people's faith in their democracy. And if people get to where they don't believe again that their voice matters, they're gonna vacate the town square, the political town square. That allows extreme elements to rush in, take over the political discourse, and that increases people's cynicism. We need good solid citizens to come back in. They are the ballast in the ship of state, but they won't come back to the political town square unless they believe that we truly represent them. And that's why I've made democracy reform a number one priority in Washington. So John, if anybody wants a lesson in political maneuvering and gerrymandering, they should look at John's district. It, it, John, describe your district for people and then we're, we're gonna wrap well, things up. But I think yeah. it's entertaining to, to explain. So, so to be fair, um, it's not easy to draw perfectly shaped districts in Maryland. If you look at Maryland, it's got one of the most crazy shapes of a state in the country to begin with. Then you run the Chesapeake Bay through it. That doesn't help matters at all. Uh, but then you sprinkle some politics into the mix and you can end up with some districts that look kind of crazy. Um, so what I always say is whoever's in my district, I'm going to give 100% to represent their interests in Washington. That's my job. I do think that nationally and in Maryland, people like the idea if we can get it in place of having a kind of independent process for drawing district lines. The challenge is you can't just do it in some states and not others because then the politics just get even worse. You need a national solution. One of the things that we built into HR1 was to require every state in America to put in place an independent redistricting commission. And then I think that'll make the, the public feel better about the whole process and maybe it helps to restore that faith I'm talking about and how our political system works. So what we did in HR1 is we assembled basically all the reforms to respond to these grievances we've been hearing from people for years and say, if we can get this done, we could overnight transform how the democracy is operating and begin to build back people's trust. Is this the heaviest lift in the world? Yes, because Washington's gotten used to doing things a certain way. People are skeptical and cynical. It's, it's a very hard lift. It's like climbing Mount Everest in gale force winds. But if we can do it, and we're gonna try our best as we move forward, we got it passed in the house. Unfortunately, Mitch McConnell's kind of standing there with his arms folded on the Senate side saying, you shall not pass when it comes to this democracy reform. But if we can get it done ultimately, we start building back that trust and faith in government, which if we don't have that, we're not gonna be able to save our society over the long term. People have to believe that their voice matters. It's their right and their expectation. And I'll say this, Scott, as um, upsetting as, as it is at times to see how angry people are about what's broken in our democracy, I actually take some solace or hope in the fact that they're still, they still care enough to, to get angry, to be angry, that they're not so beaten down that they're just walking away and throwing up their hands. They're angry because they want their voice to count. And if that is still out there, if that sentiment's still out there, and we can offer them good solutions for their anger that lift their voices up again, there's a road back to confidence in how government and politics operates in this country. It's not an easy path, but it's one I'm committed to. That, that's a great optimistic viewpoint. And John, thank you so much for your time today and, and being here and talking to the community and, and spreading the, the good word, all the stuff that you're working on and, and, and where the, the pathways are to, to a, a better government.
Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Beth. Do you have a few closing comments? I actually, before comments, I have one mm -hmm. thing we didn't talk about that I just want to give a, sure. a few, yeah. not short trip to, and that's, I, I'm putting on my associated hat for sure, and that's nonprofits in our community and how Washington can be helpful to us. We're on the front lines as well, beyond Heroes Act, beyond anything else. The people who are falling through the cracks turn to us and mm -hmm. we need to be there for them. So how is Washington looking to help nonprofit, the nonprofit sector to do the work that is so necessary in this time when dollars are so tight? So it's a great question. And obviously on behalf of all of the agencies that, that you work with um, in the Jewish community and do the outreach, it's an appropriate question. In this moment, um, as you may know, in the CARES Act, we included um, nonprofits in the PPP program, smaller nonprofits. Uh, what we weren't able to achieve in that first round of relief was to find a way to get support to some of the larger nonprofits, those who have over you know, 500 employees, for example. Um, but a lot of the smaller nonprofits uh, did benefit from the Paycheck Protection Program. I will say that's another thing that we're trying to extend in these negotiations because we know how critical it is. And frankly, if we're going to have to go into another situation of locking down for some period of time to address the virus, the importance of that support for small businesses and nonprofits is going to be absolutely critical. Going forward, there was already a discussion about um, the impact on nonprofits in terms of how people give with the tax reform uh, that was put in place. Um, because as you now know now, people aren't as inclined to itemize based on the tax changes. And so in terms of what incentivizes individuals to contribute to nonprofits, I think we need to look at that again and try to build some of those incentives back in. Again, particularly for the smaller nonprofits who benefit from those mid-level donors. They're not high rollers, but their people have a sense of commitment. And if they feel like a donation is gonna make a difference to an organization and there's also some benefit to the donor, they have the incentive to do that. So we got to do everything we can to support our nonprofit community. Um, some of the most inspiring stories, Beth, uh, are the ones that I've seen during this pandemic where I'm able to lift up a nonprofit that's making a difference for people on the front lines, our frontline workers, for example, um, and to help support and spread the word. Uh, so to me, it's the lifeblood of any community is what these nonprofits do and associated and, and, and your participating uh, agencies are a clear example of that. So thank you for, for uh, not letting us finish the conversation without uh, a discussion on that. And again, thanks to all of you for the opportunity uh, to participate today. And thank you so much for being here and taking the time for us and, and, and sharing what's really going on in that, in that DC world that we don't get to see every day. So uh, Jonathan, do you have anything or should I just go on to close? Nope, Congressman, thank you so much. Beth, why don't you wrap us up today? So I wanna remind everyone, first of all, that if you haven't completed the census, please do so. It is critical that everyone in Maryland get counted so that we receive the essential federal funding to help our community over the next decade. I will say having done it, I actually did it from Florida because that's where I was, but I did it by phone and it was, it was very pleasant and I felt great when it was finished. So go to 2020census.gov and make sure you participate in that. I will also say second Scott's comments, it was so easy to go online and register to get an absentee ballot. And I am so not tech savvy. So I encourage everyone to make sure they do that at the same time. And we'll be back next Tuesday. Our guests will be Beth DeFilla Community Day School Director, Dr. Sippy Shore, and Krieger Schechter Day School Head of School, Rabbi Moshe Schwartz. So Tuesday, August 18th at noon.
And Scott, did you want to say something? No, you know, I want to make one little comment and then say goodbye to everybody. John, I just want to tell you how special your dad was to this state and this community. And wanted to make sure we, we, we mentioned your dad on this call and to the community. So, I appreciate it, Scott, and I will relay that to him. I'll be talking to him later this evening. Wonderful, wonderful. And so, so Scott, th thank, Scott, I want to thank you, too, for saying that, because earlier in the conversation, I, I couldn't kind of get his face out of, of, you know, because, John, you really do have, you know, a, a, a quite a resemblance, at least on Zoom. And so <laughs> for those of us old enough, Scott always talks about how old he is. I'm older, who, who knew your father well, you know, at that time, um, yes, please, please give him our best. I will. And everyone else out there, please don't forget to visit associated.org and jmoreliving.com for more information, stories, and resources, and sign up for the weekly newsletter. And until we meet again, be well. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.